obvious proposition that if um, you know, all sale deposits are going to run, retail deposits are stable because they are insured. Um, and therefore, you should treat them differently. And the answer is no. So, you know, our view at this stage, and we need more research to, to confirm that, but our view is that they should be treated similarly because they are de facto insured both. So it's the, it's the UA insured for retail deposits, but for all sale deposits, they can run. And, you know, in general, they will. And that's pretty the thing. So they are de facto insured. There are some exceptions. I mean, you know, sometimes they get stuck, but, you know, by and large, uh, they, are, they are actually... Uh, so you cannot bear them in. So they are very similar in that sense. And that also emphasizes a close link between uh, uh, liquidity and solvency. But the other thing that you can show is that this formula is not enough if you have fire cells. If you have fire cells, you have to add, append some kind of uh, minimum level one liquidity level, which is exactly what the regulation does. Uh, so as to avoid the fire sales on uh, less liquid asset uh, level two ones. Okay. Um, international aspect, um, let me just uh, say, um, single resolution board, there are still lots of other questions in Europe. The availability of resources, uh, assuming that we have solved the Berlin issue, which is, I'm sure that there will be some discussion of that. Uh, the so the, in principle, there are insurance premium and public backstop, so you need to have a public backstop as well. Um, and of course, there is a constructive ambiguity. I mean, that has always existed. You know, when, when a bank is in default, uh, you always have the issue of, uh, of whether you want to bail the bank out or not. Um, and um, now it's even more complex because there's a question about if you bail it out, what kind of public money are you going to use? Are you going to use um, the European fund, or are you going to use a national, uh, a national bailout? And, you know, my guess, and nobody has studied this game, but that will be a, a real game, um, is it going to be a war of attrition, or is it going to be some, some other kind of thing? Um, it's clear that, say, for example, if a country is in deep trouble, then uh, Europe will be more eager, of course, to have a European bailout because a national bailout will, uh, will actually make the country even, even worse off. Um, we, we don't know, but there's a, there's a game which is going to be played which has never been thought of. Um, and of course, that game is going to impact ex-ante accountability because when a bank is in trouble, um, there are at least two culprits. There, there will be the ECB for the lack of supervision, maybe, maybe, maybe not. And there will be the country itself for its uh, microeconomic climate. So all this you know, is going to affect incentive, and we need to, to think a little bit more about that. An interesting question um, about international aspect is the maintenance of systemically important functions under BRRD. Um, and there is a list. And this list looks reasonable. Uh, but is it reasonable? I, I don't know. Um, what is the rationale for this classification? What is the overall architecture, right? So, for example, if a money market mutual funds lends uh, under seven days to a bank, then it's not bailable. That de facto means that you have insured deposits in the shadow banking sector. Now, we are used to have deposit insurance in the retail banking sector, but now you know you put your money in a, in, a, in a money market mutual funds. That money puts uh, that that fund puts money in the bank, and with a maturity of less than seven days, it's insured, and you're done. Um, what is the incentive and general equilibrium effect? So people talk about billionability, but you know once you bill in the claims, it completely changes your balance sheet. Uh, you know the market will react, and you know if you don't think about that. So I just want to point out the limits of our knowledge on the question. And I think, I think we, we must do much better than we do, honestly. Uh, what about the resolution of states? <laughs> Sorry about the terminology. Um, and there is the issue, and I will conclude with that, with the European Monetary Fund. And I would like to have a discussion on that because I'm not, I don't have a completely clear view of what's good. And there's a lot of enthusiasm about creating a European Monetary Fund. Uh, 
Um, and there are good arguments for that. One is that um, those are European affairs. And you know you can more easily internalize the risk created, say for example, by budgetary discipline. I don't like too much austerity either, but you know um, the ECB are probably with. We, we all actually wish the politicians were more courageous to, say, you know, and, and actually instead of delegating to the European Central Bank, which at some point might compromise its independence, which I think is very crucial. Um, that would be nice to actually have the ECB no longer a fiscal agenda of last resort. And it's possible insurance against the potential IMF disinterest in Europe. But there are also risk to a European monetary fund. Um, it's too small. I mean, it's a region of the world. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that may be a trouble. The IMF and, and, and the lenders of the IMF actually spread risk over more countries. Uh, expertise is bigger too, because you have a bigger, it's worldwide. Um, the risk also with the EMF is politics. politics. Uh, we have seen that in Greece. I mean, there's a good reason why the IMF actually is part of the Troika, is that before it was part, not, not much moved. And uh, um, the IMF, by the way, is too political. The US has too much influence on, on the IMF. But that's, that's another thing, which is that um, you know, this, is, this is difficult. And a related point is that it's going to create blame shifting, because if, if the European Monetary Fund is, is actually uh, uh, being tough and asking for lots of concessions and conditionality, then there will be a lot of resentment. I mean, we see it with the Troika today. So you know, it's, it's difficult. And there are lots of other questions. Should the contribution be risk-based? And, and you know, do you want to have automatic rather than voluntary pre-qualification? Pre, pre so let me stop here and thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean. And uh, I think it was a very nice transition from the discussions of yesterday and today. So you have this good transition. So, because Martin, you are going, I understand, to focus on funding liquidity. And Yun, you are going to focus on market liquidity. So then we have a, a good picture, I think, and then we listen to the, the two discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me also thank the organizers for putting up this event and for having me talk about this subject here. Liquidity provision of the last resort, of course, when one talks about liquidity provision of the last resort and the lender of the last resort, one recalls budgets prescription lent freely to solvent banks against good collateral at penalty rates. And uh, Barry Eichengreen's book has shown how this was completely failed in the Great Depression, where most central banks were driven by the fear of losing gold reserves. In the financial crisis, Euro crisis, we did have uh, liquidity support from uh, central banks, in particular the ECB, freely. Solvency was often in doubt, in particular at the time of the LTRO. Collateral was at mixed quality and rates were low. So one of the points that has come up in discussions about central bank intervention in the past 10 years has been, have you really done what Badgett proposed? But of course, Badgett was worried about viability of central banks at the time of the gold standard. That issue ha is no longer around, but has been replaced in particular in Germany by uh, worries or professions of worries about moral hazard and about the potential losses that central banks might make from their interventions. Before the crisis, of course, we lived in a nirvana. We had the MOUs of the early 2000s. Solvency problems will be dealt with by national governments, liquidity problems of individual banks by national central banks, liquidity problems of the system by the ECB through market interventions. That nirvana was a fiction of political economy. The national governments and the national central banks did not want to give up their power over uh, their banks, and the ECB didn't want to get involved in charges where they had no control. 
And of course, things didn't quite work out that way. Over the past decade, we've had the issue of how to deal with doubts about solvency, how to deal with the danger of losses. I'll not talk about that. I think that that's uh, basically uh, a red herring from people who don't understand that we have fiat money. And we have significant discussions about emergency liquidity assistance to commercial banks. Of course, emergency liquidity assistance to commercial banks has been a bone of contention both in the Irish crisis and repeatedly in the Greek crisis, where one argument was uh, this is just enabling insolvent banks to continue, but also the Cypriot crisis. This is just uh, allowing insolvent banks to persist in business. The opposite argument was, in the Irish case and in the Greek case, the threat of discontinuation or the actual discontinuation or freeze of emergency liquidity assistance was simply a means of blackmailing the member state governments in the interest of the creditors, which raises questions about the power of whoever is deciding about emergency uh, liquidity assistance. If you go back to where this device came from, it came from those MOUs where uh, the responsibility lay with the National Central Bank because of an interest of the National Central Banks in having that control and the ECB is not wanting to get involved. Given that supervision is now with the uh, ECB, is no longer at the national level, Moral hazard issues from supervision would seem to be somewhat reduced if what was to make that the charge of the ECB. I want to raise the question how seriously we have to take the solvency requirement, and that's something that needs much thinking. If we want liquidity support because we are afraid of contagion, the contagion argument is independent of whether the bank in question is solvent or not. Lehman Brothers would be one example. Danat Bank in 1931 in Germany would be another example. The bank was heavily insolvent. It did receive liquidity assistance until the Reichsbank was no longer able to do this. And after that, when they stopped, all hell broke loose. The bad year, 1932, and what followed had a fair amount to do with that crisis. Given the costs that contagion can have, it seems that insistence on solvency in that constellation may not be quite appropriate. The counter argument is that we need to ensure exit, failing banks, should leave the market, and in particular in situations where we have excess capacity in the market, we must have mechanisms that prevent the supervisors and the authorities from just maintaining these banks in the market and thereby uh, exerting pressure on other banks, on the margins of other banks, and endangering the viability of the industry. Uh, Failure to ensure exit, an example of that is given in Cyprus, I would maintain that also some of the support that Germany has given to many banks is an example of maintenance of excess capacities uh, at the cost of having uh, risk uh, to the system persist. Uh, before I turn to resolution, I would like to add a point that I forgot to put in the slides, which is that if you think about the problem of liquidity provision by central banks, even in ordinary times, a key question is, 
What's the role of interbank markets? The standard approach over the past decades has been for the central bank to provide liquidity in some way or other and to rely on interbank markets to allocate the funds properly. With the breakdown of interbank markets in 2008, that was replaced by a policy of full allotment, allowing the banks themselves to just say whether they need the stuff. Uh, in a situation where interbank markets tend to yield sharply differing profiles of bank activity from one country to another. The issue of relying on interbank markets is also an issue of incidence of central bank policy across member states. And the replacement of interbank markets by something like a full allotment policy raises question, questions of how monetary policy impinges on different countries, with the deeper question of how to do monetary policy at all with a fragmented financial system. I've inserted this here because many of the po political controversies at much of the, say, nationalist resistance, in particular in Germany, against ECB policy over the past 10 years has to do with this fragmentation and the asymmetries of policy and the asymmetries of liquidity support that have gone along with this. If you think about the long-term refinancing operation of 2011-2012, that the use of that, reliance of that, was asymmetric between periphery countries and the North. And I'm not saying this in order to uh, imply any blame. I'm just saying this because the asymmetry itself uh, shapes the political discussion about central bank policy, including the discussion about uh, the legal aspects. One thing which regulatory reform has paid too little attention to is the issue of liquidity and resolution. If you think about the situation in the United States, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation takes over an institution and then sees to it what can be done there. If this takes time, in the case of the SNLs, it took 10 years. Well, they have interim funding from the US Treasury. So where would funding for resolution, in resolution, and for winding down come from? In the case of Banco Popular Español, the resolution action was taken overnight. There had been a run, and even emergency liquidity assistance, which was approved one day, did not prevent the bank from giving up the next day. And the bank was then sold uh, for one euro to Santander uh, with a bail-in of certain uh, subordinated uh, security holders. Uh, valuation procedures in such a situation are, of course, problematic because everything is rushed. But there is no liquidity. The BRD and the SRM regulation say nothing about liquidity. While these things were discussed, I raised the issue with various officials, and it was clear they didn't want to talk about it. If you are talking about liquidity and resolution, for an institution like BNP Paribas or Deutsche Bank, you're talking about a quadruple digit billion number. If you think about the controversy of the triple digit billion number for the ESM, you can see that that would be politically, uh, why, why that would have been considered politically uh, infeasible. The single resolution fund is not up to the task. There you have a double-digit billion number that you're talking about, uh, 
that's not enough to keep, say, the money market funds continuing to fund an institution like Deutsche or BNP Paribas. They would need guarantees of amounting to more than one trillion euros. Now, in some of these discussions, I've heard the response, well, the ECB must do it. The ECB, of course, has recently taken a decision that they will not get involved with funding of institutions in a resolution, and for good reason. Solvency of these institutions is in doubt. And uh, how would this uh, go with the, uh, with the notion that liquidity from the central bank should be provided to solvent institutions? In fact, I've been told that even in 2008, the Bundesbank resisted providing liquidity to Hupo real estate unless it was given a guarantee by the federal government. So I think we need a reform that provides for liquidity in resolution, either in the form of government guarantees continue, ensuring continued market finance, where the key issues would be money markets and large depositors, or in the form of ECB funding supported by guarantees uh, from the SRM fund, possibly a fiscal backstop. In practice, the actual losses, and even and there the SNL experience uh, is quite telling, the actual losses tend to be much smaller than the amounts that are at stake while the operation is still running. But the guarantees must be credible enough to allow the pers uh, persistence of the operation at least while it is running. Now, there is another aspect of the uh, problem which uh, doesn't come under the guise of BRD SRM regulation as they're uh, formulated right now, which is what do you do if a bank is being wound down? You wind down a portfolio of non-performing loans. In the case of the S&Ls, as I said, the FDIC took some 10 years. The result of that 10-year that wait was that the actual losses to uh, outsiders, meaning taxpayers, plus the, uh, F, the, the institutions fund the bank levy, uh, was cut from an estimated 600 to 800 billion dollars estimate as of 1990 to 154 billion once the business had been done. It's still a large number, but uh, quite a different uh, order of magnitude. And the problem is, of course, that a loan portfolio, in contrast to some machinery or so, is not something that you can wind down quickly, or rather it's something where the difference between the returns when you wind down slowly and the returns when you wind down quickly is quite significant. So that some patience and some, uh, some institutional device that enables a delay of that procedure uh, would be called for. And for that reason, uh, I have a fair amount of sympathy for the special procedure introduced by the Italian government for the Venetian banks, which did step outside the regular norms of uh, the uh, of the insolvency law, because insolvency law would require a quick resolution, but at the same time uh, provided for a slow wind down rather than a quick one. Here again, I would suggest that perhaps the shifting the winding down of banks out of the insolvency law and to the European level would make sense with an institution shaped on the pattern of the, of the FDIC, with, of course, the resources to actually do this administratively. 
There again, the interim funding issue comes up. Again, the question of the ECB, guarantees, and on the whole, one cannot do without a fiscal backstop. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, on ELA, it's always a question of the, the efficiency of the resolution process in the end. So that's also uh, introducing the next, uh, the, the following panel also. And uh, so, and, uh, and who foots the bill at the end? You know, that, these are the questions. But you're quite right on the, uh, on the guarantee question on liquidity and resolution. Benoit Curé is here, I mean, because actually in the ECB is in charge of uh, the preparation of the ELA dossiers. And uh, so he may intervene in the uh, Q&A a bit later today. If you agree, Benoit, and that, uh, market liquidity. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. It's a great privilege to be here. Um, let me uh, switch gears somewhat and talk about market liquidity and also broaden the subject matter to uh, also encompass what's happening in emerging markets. The backdrop uh, for this presentation is the shift in the pattern of intermediation that we've seen from the banking sector uh, to the capital markets, in particular the bond market. And um, what we see for dollar-denominated debt, and we focused on dollar-denominated debt of non-banks outside the United States. Um, the total is now uh, 11.5 trillion. That's on the left-hand panel. But the notable feature is that the proportion in blue, which is in debt securities, uh, has now grown. So the black line is the proportion uh, of dollar-denominated debt in the form of uh, bank loans. That peaked uh, around, uh, at around 60% just before the crisis and has now come down very substantially. The right-hand panel is for emerging markets, and even there, uh, we have seen a very rapid decline in the bank share. So the story is very much about capital markets, uh, and in particular, uh, bond markets. What about local currency sovereign bonds? Uh, well, um, uh, Barry Eichengreen is here this morning, but Barry and uh, Ricardo Hausman coined the concept of original sin. And the idea there was that uh, if you looked at the diagnosis for what happened in the 1990s, emerging markets were unable to borrow in their own currency and therefore were pushed into uh, borrowing in dollars and therefore had to bear the consequences of currency mismatch. Well, it turns out that original sin has well and truly uh, been overcome in the sense that emerging market sovereigns have been able to issue local currency debt. And very large proportions of local currency debt are held in uh, the portfolios of non-resident investors. So for countries like South Africa and Indonesia, the proportion of local currency sovereign bonds held by non-resident investors is uh, in excess of 40%. And you see that many other countries are very close. Now, having said all that, uh, it turns out that the spirit of original sin is very much uh, alive. And let me focus my remarks uh, on that uh, point. And I'll get to the role of the central bank um, uh, at the end. So let me uh, introduce this with, uh, by introducing you to the concept of duration. So the duration of a bond is a weighted average of the dates of its cash flows. And the weights correspond to how much of the present value of that bond payoff uh, are attributable to that date. So if it's a zero coupon bond, the maturity is the duration. If it's a coupon bond, the duration tends to be somewhat uh, smaller than the, than the maturity because there are some coupon payments. It turns out that uh, duration is also a very good measure. This is a theorem which says that duration is also the sensitivity of the return on holding the bond to a shift in the yield. Okay, so uh, technically it's the proportional change in the, in the price divided by uh, the change in the, in the yield. Now, if we have investors that are local currency-based investors, like a local pension fund, or a global investor who has a global portfolio, then the currency in which you measure that return 
is going to be very important. So when we look at the numerator of the duration expression, we can measure that return either in local currency terms or in dollar terms. So if we were to plot it uh, like this, if we were to plot the, the percentage return on the vertical axis and the yield change on the horizontal axis, we would expect to see clusters uh, on the first quadrant and on the last quadrant because there's a negative relationship between the yield change and, and the return. But we can draw two sets of clusters depending on whether it's a dollar return or a local currency return. So here's just a, just a taste, um, a foretaste of what's com coming up. It looks like this. Blue dots are the local currency uh, realizations, and the red is the dollar realizations. You see that uh, on the left-hand side, the red dots are higher than the blue dots, which is to say if you're a dollar-based investor, so if you care about returns in dollar terms or in hard currency terms, then you're very well off on this side of the chart because not only do you gain from the fall in the yield, you also gain from the exchange rate move. The local currency is appreciating against the dollar. So you gain on both legs of the trade. But uh, if you're in uh, times like uh, today when we see tightening conditions, uh, the dollar-based investor actually does worse because the value change, the value decline due to yield increases are amplified by the decline in the local currency. So this is the sense in which people talk about tightening financial conditions when the dollar is strong. So because uh, on the right-hand panel, on the right-hand uh, side of this panel are those realizations when the dollar is strong. And these realizations tend to be associated with higher yields and therefore tighter financial conditions. Now, we can do this for local currency bonds country by country. Uh, first panel there is Indonesia. These are uh, indices of uh, bonds that consist of five to seven years maturity. So this is why the slope is around, the blue slope is around 4.5. That's the duration measure for uh, Indonesian government bonds, according to this index. But the red line is steeper. Red line has a slope of 6.6. For Brazil, uh, the disparity is, in, is even higher. The local currency duration is 4.34. The red line is 8.52. So if you're a dollar-based investor and you're investing in five-year Brazilian government bonds, you're in effect investing in a 10-year bond if you care about duration. If you look at Mexico and South Africa, the disparity is even higher. So there, uh, the slopes are 5 and 4.5, respectively, in local currency terms, but the dollar duration is in excess of 12. So if you're a dollar-based investor, you have five-year government bonds in Mexico and South Africa. You're, in effect, investing in 15-year maturity bonds in dollar terms. So what's going on here? Well, you, you may be wondering, well, isn't, this, isn't there something suspicious here? Could this just be mechanical? And just to reassure you that there's nothing mechanical here, uh, I've plotted France and Sweden uh, in the same way, and there is no relationship uh, with the red and the, and the blue. So if anything, the dollar duration is much lower for, um, for France uh, and for Sweden. So there's something else going on. And I think um, uh, this... And of course, everything is, uh, everything is endogenous here. Yields and ex exchange rates, they're all determined in the market. And why is it that we have this correlation, that when the dollar is strong, uh, we have this big uh, disparity in, um, in, the, um, in the returns? I think this is where we have to take a step back and look at the bigger picture, because in a debt contract, there are borrowers, clearly, but there are also lenders, there are the investors. And one way one can think about this is uh, one way to understand what's going on is to shine a light on the behavior of investors. And to ask why is it that when yields are falling, uh, the, the dollar is weaker and local currency is surging and uh, there is greater investment and capital inflows, whereas on the other side we have everything going in the other direction. 
So one way of uh, understanding this, perhaps, is to say, if the uh, global investor has uh, some risk allocation to the portfolio, and the risk allocation is, denom uh, is denominated in dollar terms or in advanced economy currency terms, then when currencies move and prices move, uh, uh, depending on how the exchange rate moves, those risk limits will bind harder or less, depending on which way the exchange rate goes. But if these uh, charts uh, are any indication, it's when the dollar is strong and these local currency government bonds are falling in value that the, that the risk limits are binding harder. Uh, because that is when uh, they would be uh, selling, and the selling tends to amplify both the price declines as well as exchange rate moves. So that would be one way to understand uh, what's going on. Now, what is, the, what is the right policy response if you have something that is driven by shifts in risk appetite or risk premium shocks rather than uh, the underlying fundamental shocks? Well, I think this is where a market maker of last resort may well be a very uh, important uh, institutional backstop. Ideally, the best thing would be to have institutional investors in these countries that measure their returns in local currency terms. Presumably one of the reasons why we see no relationship here in the advanced economies is that uh, in both France and in Sweden, there is a very deep layer of domestic investors, domestic pension funds, life insurance companies, and households who measure their returns in local currency terms. And therefore, they're, they're the natural buyers, if you like. They're the natural buyers, uh, and therefore, they can uh, cushion the shocks. If, on the other hand, you do not have a very deep layer of domestic investors who can play that buffering role, then there may be a role for the central bank or some other uh, large investor who can take the other side um, when, when this is happening. And that works both, for the way, both on the way up, when there is a, when there is a lot of uh, um, capital inflows, portfolio inflows, driving up the price and driving up the currency, as well as uh, when the investors are selling and exiting, where you can go in and, uh, and intervene, either buy the bonds directly, or if the legal uh, framework does not allow that, uh, you can intervene in other ways by uh, going into the, the forward market, providing swaps, uh, and otherwise trying to stabilize the exchange rate in a way that uh, uh, mitigates the way that um, exchange rate moves amplify the gains and losses for the uh, international investors. So another way of uh, putting this is to say, well, uh, how do we know that this is indeed a risk premium rather than simply uh, exchange rates reflecting uh, some underlying fundamentals? Uh, there's a very nice paper by Wen Shen Du and Jesse Schrager uh, a couple of years ago where they defined what they called, um, it's what we call the Du Schrager spread. And uh, this is, if you like, a, a spread on holding local currency emerging market sovereign bonds, but calculated from the point of view of a dollar-based investor. So this is the thought experiment. I start with some dollars. I swap those dollars into... Mexican pesos, say, and then I, uh, then I can extinguish the currency risk because I can now exit uh, with a given currency um, value at the end of my trade. But then I deposit my money by buying um, Mexican government bonds. Then I can calculate the, the return to that trade and compare it with the yield on the treasury, uh, on the equivalent uh, maturity treasury yield. And the difference would be the spread. Now, there is some risk there. Uh, you know, there could be counterparty risk, or you could, over, you, know, you could have overhedged by having too much of a swap. But the risks are sort of fairly small, especially since this is fully collateralized. And uh, we can think of this as a risk premium from the point of view of a dollar-based investor. And it turns out that the Duschregger spread behaves in a very... Um, in a very predictable way, uh, and it depends very much on the dollar exchange rate. It's when the dollar is strong that the Duschregger spread is large. So um, if your risk appetite were large enough, uh, 
these are the times that you should be jumping into emerging market uh, government bonds. Although these are exactly the times that uh, uh, large portfolio investors would be reluctant to do so because there are lots of governance and risk management constraints that actually bind. This, I think, points to the importance of exchange rates as, um, as a financial variable, as well as the exchange rates as something that uh, regulates the real economy variables through the, net, um, through the net exports channel. And it goes in the opposite direction to the net exports channel, because it's when your currency is strong that uh, you have an expansionary effect. And it's when your currency is weak that uh, you have a contractionary effect. That's exactly the opposite of the net exports channel. So um, let me just, uh, just leave you with this chart. Uh, probably I, I will not take you through this chart. Um, this is meant to show exactly this uh, risk-taking channel where uh, when the dollar is strong, the black line is the, is the four-quarter change in the dollar exchange rate, and the solid red and the dotted red are the four-quarter changes uh, in the bank flows and the uh, and the bond uh, flows, respectively. But uh, um, I think the, uh, the, the discussion in the final session, uh, no doubt, will also come back to this. But let me uh, stop there for now, Peter. Thank you very much. Now, of course, you didn't go into what, how would it work, you market maker of last resort, of yes. course. And, uh, and Jean, you addressed this uh, incidentally in your presentation. The, the difficulties, of course, of uh, the distribution and impacts, you know. And, uh, so I, th I hope it comes back in the discussion later today. And, uh, so Elena, you, you will address more the, uh, the uh, funding uh, question, uh, Martin, basically, and, yes. and Jean to some extent. So good morning and thanks for the organizer to invite me to this conference. As you have seen, the panel has been quite rich in terms of topics that have been covered. So what I thought of doing was to bring it a little back, uh, the, um, the discussion a bit back to more narrowly defined the land of last resort. And instead of looking at more at theories or arguments that we have heard already a lot, I thought to bring a little bit the question to the data. So who has been the land of last resort indeed in the euro area and how this works? Who were the banks that actually use this facility and what are the implications of this? So in particular, I would like to, to uh, touch upon three topic, two, three points. One is to go back a little bit, as Martin did, to the idea of budget and what were the implications of the theory of land of last resort according to budget principles, and who has been the land of last resort in the euro area, with, of course, the ECB playing a very dominant role in that capacity as provider of market liquidity, but in the sense of systemic liquidity needs in the market. Then second, as I said, I would like to talk about who are the borrowers, who did effectively use this facility of the ECB, and what they did with this liquidity. So did they do what the budget prescribed they should be doing, or did they really do something else? And this brings me to the topic that also Jean a little bit touched about, the sovereign and bank nexus, whether this is indeed a doom loop or a not a doom loop, and or whether this was inevitable, as we heard already yesterday. And finally, very briefly about the other two forms of liquidity provision that in particular Martin talked about. One is the emergency liquidity assistant and second, liquidity in resolution. So let me start from the first topic. What are the principles of budget? So as we know, the principle of budget are in a way were very simple. Maybe this was another financial system. This was not the financial system we have today. But the idea was that the central banks should lend freely to illiquid but solvent banks against good collateral, but not good collateral in crisis times, but rather good collateral evaluated at the pre-crisis values and at the penalty rate to discourage mark, uh, the access to the land of last resort and rather incentivize banks to use markets. Importantly, when should banks use the land of last resort? Well, they should use it when they face temporary liquidity needs. What does it mean temporary liquidity needs in particular when they are subject to runs, and even more, in particular, when they are subject to panic runs, as Jean also distinguished between panic runs and fundamental runs, in the sense that these are banks that are temporarily subject to self-fulfilling runs, but they are solvent. So their conditions, their fundamental are good, they are just illiquid. What is the implication of this? And this is important when I will go to the data. Well, the implication is that if the land of last resort should be used to tackle temporary liquidity needs, 
there should be no implication as to what concerns the asset side of banks, in the sense that we should just see banks taking central bank liquidity and use it to satisfy temporary liquidity needs, but not to invest in assets. So temporary liquidity needs coming from runs, coming from loan commitments, coming from margin calls eventually, but not invest in assets, and in particular, not invest in, in risky securities. This is not the ultimate goal of the liquidity that budget had in mind in terms of use. Now, although budget in a way refers to individual liquidity assistance, the same principle apply more in general to land of last resort as market liquidity provider in case of systemic liquidity crisis. So I was myself a student at the LSE with Charles Goodat actually in the late 90s, and I do remember that there were a lot of discussion at the time as to what the land of last resort should be doing in the sense, should just lend to individual banks, should just lend to market, and then markets would reshuffle liquidity, going to the banks that would need it, so open market operation would be enough, we wouldn't need individual lending. Do we really need to, to lend only to in uh, liquid banks, but what about fear of solvency, what about risk of contagion? So this debate, in a way, dates back the, night, the late 90s, where these questions were very much addressed at the time. Now, what happened in terms of empirical? How has the land of last resort played out in the euro area? So as also Martin mentioned, there were two important changes to the ECB uh, liquidity provision facility. One after Lehman Brothers was the move to the fixed rate full allotment so that banks can borrow unlimited amounts at prevailing rate against suitable collateral, and DCB has the collateral schedule with all the conditions that are required to be fulfilled. And this, in a way, made de facto irrelevant the other facility that the ECB has, which is the marginal lending facility, because banks could simply go to the full allotment to the MRO or the LTRO later on. There was another important change that somehow has not been discussed so far, which is the haircut subsidies. So what happened at some point during the crisis was that the ECB changed the haircut that was actually charging on collateral pledge with the ECB. In particular, it charged below market haircuts for riskier securities and equal or larger haircuts for safer securities. So let me say a bond posted with the ECB would have the same haircut as the market, if not a higher, whereas a Portuguese or an Italian bond or a, or a risky securities, whatever you can think of a risky security, would rather receive a subsidy. And this is important, as I will show you in a minute. So what are the implications of these two changes? Well, the implication is that the ECB acted de facto as a lens of a last resort for the whole euro area, replacing the overnight interbank market during the financial crisis of 2008-2010 and stimulating liquidity supply to banks during instead the sovereign crisis. And here, going back to uh, Martin, actually managed to reach stressed countries. So uh, liquidity was reshuffled and reached uh, banks sitting in um, stressed countries in the years 2011, 2013. Who borrowed? Who used the ECB facility? Well, interesting enough, it's not just banks in weaker countries, but within those is actually the weaker banks in weaker countries. So the main borrowers of ECB uh, liquidity was actually weakly capitalized banks, took out more LRR liquidity, and also they pledged riskier security as collateral relative to strongly capitalized bank. And in a way, this was a little bit of a consequence of a haircut subsidy that induced banks to pledge the risky security with the ECB. So this is, let me say, this is evidence taken uh, from a paper by Drexel and Co. It was published in the Journal of Finance 2016. And you can see in this picture, this is the amount of Greek sovereign bonds pledged with the ECB. And you can see from 2007 to 2011, the solid line is the Greek bonds pledged with the ECB, whereas the dotted line is the one pledged in the private repo market. And you can see that over time, the amount of Greek bonds pledged with the ECB increased significantly, while the one pledged with the private market actually decreased significantly. And at some point, the market here stopped even accepting these Greek, um, these Greek bonds. 
So is this in contrast with budget, or is not in contrast with budget? I think Martin mentioned that somehow there was risky or dubious collateral. Well, in a way, it's not in contrast with, uh, with budget, because budget prescribes that we, to avert the crisis, we should have collateral at pre-crisis values. So to the extent that Greek bonds were actually good collateral at pre-crisis value, accepting them during the crisis was not in contrast with budget. What, importantly, the haircut subsidy did, though, was forcing the redistribution of the risky collateral from the strongly capitalized banks to the weakly capitalized banks. So this is the consequence of this. Now let me go to the other question, which is, who, what did banks do? What did the borrowers do with this liquidity that they borrowed from the ECB, still using the same paper? Well, it comes out that the weakly capitalized banks borrow at least in part to buy risky assets such as distressed sovereign debt. So they actually did use liquidity of the ECB to buy distressed sovereign debt, and this relation is entirely driven by the weakly capitalized banks, and not the strongly capitalized banks doing it are the weakly capitalized banks. And in terms of numbers, you see that a 10% increase in a bank pledging of distressed sovereign debt is associated with the 4.5 increase in its holding. And the relationship is stronger for domestic pledge distress sovereign debt. So meaning again that, for example, an Italian bank uses domestic Italian bonds, it pledges with the ECB, and it buys with the money it receives Italian sovereign debt. Now this is the question that we touched again uh, already yesterday and somehow with Jean today. Is this an unending consequence of the land of last resort? Is this incentivizing the nexus between banks and sovereign, or what is it? And here, of course, this is in contrast with the land of last resort principle, because in a way, banks shouldn't buy a risky asset with this, but they should rather deal with temporary liquidity needs. And it's also in line with the broader literature on collateral trade in Portuguese banks, or with the more general idea that there is this nexus between banks and sovereign. So let me say, so this is, if this is a risk shifting, is the risk shifting necessarily negative? So we know from, for example, the paper by Emmanuel and Jean that there is a doom loop between banks and sovereign because there is this double sort of um, bailout or reliance on the banks can rely on bailouts and the sovereigns can rely on international forgiveness by international creditors. But there is another theory of risk shifting that is a little bit more benign, if you want, towards whether it's a doom loop or not, which is that domestic banks prefer the risk profile of domestic sovereign bonds, in particular in bad times. And these are papers by Crosignani, by Gennaioli and others, again in the Journal of Finance. And in a way, if we believe in these other theories, the doom loop is not really a doom loop, but what effectively happened is that it's a little bit the idea of banks as a stabilizer. During stress time, banks are acquiring domestic sovereign bonds. This reduces the funding costs of the sovereign, and overall, it actually uh, also in increases the willingness to pay of the sovereign, and overall, this reduces the sovereign debt probability. So it's not meant as a bad doom loop, but it's actually meant as a stabilizer mechanism in stress times. From here, they need to distinguish between stress times, as we already already yesterday, and normal times. I know I'm out of time, so let me just finish with these two points. One is on the emergency liquidity assistance. So there is, so the, as I said before, the marginal lending facility was de facto redundant during the crisis, but not the emergency liquidity assistance. Let me remind you of the difference. The emergency liquidity assistance is done by the national central banks which means the risk rely with the national central banks and eventually the national government. And the collateral framework is a little bit broader and less defined or not defined relative to the ECB collateral framework. So the emergency liquidity assistance they use was not eliminated. It was still used in particular to deal with deeper crises like the Greek banks or Portuguese to some extent or Ireland. Is the need of centralization? Is the need of non-centralization? Well, again, it depends on whether countries, I mean, centralizing it would probably make it a little bit more objective, less subject to domestic influence in a way. But centralizing it also requires a risk sharing to some extent, because now the risks are going to be borne by the ECB balance sheet and not anymore by the national balance sheet with the willingness of the countries to 
in a way provide the liquidity in deeper crises. And in the absence of other mechanisms, and given the current situation, maybe this willingness is not necessarily there. So the need of a centralization is important if then countries would be able to use the ELA, it would be to use the ELA for. Let me stop here, given that I'm. Thank you. Time. Thank you very much, Helen. The, well, the, um, the point, of course, you have to look at over time also. When you say they buy, they buy government bonds, but uh, later on, uh, what Did you see you is that uh, credit uh, has recovered, you know, and that. so if you prolong yeah, a little no, bit uh, right. the study, you agree with that, no? Yes, you agree with that. <laughs> so there is a little bit a sort of transition issue that. Uh, Charles, welcome, Charles. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, Peter. Thank you. It's actually <coughs> also rather a relief. Uh, for example, yesterday afternoon, the word Brexit was mentioned only once. And the word Northern Irish border would never got mentioned at all. So uh, I'm enjoying being able to talk about other people's problems, not my own. Um, the, uh, uh, the budget rule has been mentioned several times. Uh, and I'm afraid it's an illustration that people uh, rely more on other people than actually read the basic paper themselves, because the budget rule never, ever said the word penalty. I actually once got a research assistant to go through the whole of Lombard Street, and the word penalty, I think, is mentioned once, and not at all in relationship uh, to monetary operations at all. What Badgett said was you should lend freely on good collateral at a very high interest rate. Now, there's a significant difference, and the difference is this. Penalty implies the rate at which you lend is to be higher than the rate that a borrower could obtain on the private market. Well, very high does not bear that particular inference. So if you are lending at a penalty rate, the only people who will go to you for liquidity assistance will be those who are totally incapable of borrowing money at any rate anywhere else. And that means that if you were seen as going to the central bank for liquidity, it is an absolute indication that you are on the rocks. And that leads to stigma, which means that no bank, commercial bank or other potential borrower, will go to the central bank until everything else has been exhausted, probably including fire sales. And that means that the central bank liquidity is provided far too late and the central bank doesn't get into the game nearly early enough. Also, the repetition of the phrase penalty rate uh, means that there is much too little consideration of what the appropriate rate at which the central bank should lend should be, which is, an, in fact, an interesting question. And Badgett's very high rate was also influenced by a couple of factors that are no longer present. The first factor, of course, was that that was a time of the gold standard, and if you had a crisis, there was almost always an external drain at the same time as there was an internal drain, and therefore you had to have pretty high rates in order to prevent uh, the external drain. The second issue was that the central banks then uh, were privately owned, uh, and they needed to remain profitable. And the time when a central bank would obtain profitability was when people came to borrow from it. So they wanted to make sure you got a high enough rate to maintain your profitability and your solvency. And neither of those conditions are nearly as uh, cogent now as they were then. So let us turn to the next question about uh, how should or what are the rates to which, at which central banks should lend to those needing liquidity. And indeed, they are, should be high. But what should determine them? And in my view, they should be state dependent. One of the states should actually be the degree to which there is already stigma about going to the central bank. The greater the stigma in your area or your country or wherever, the lower the rate that the central bank should be prepared to provide in order to encourage commercial banks in trouble to go to the, the central bank in time so that you can try and achieve recovery rather than have, have to have resolution. 
The second consideration is how many banks are having to go. The greater the number of banks, the greater the likelihood of systemic and contagious crises. So the greater the number of banks, the lower the rate should be. The fewer the banks, the more likely it is that it's a bank that has taken either a silly risk or has done something else stupid. And therefore, the fewer the banks, the higher the rate should be. On the other hand, the more that a bank has to borrow and the more persistent a bank has to borrow, uh, that suggests that that bank was doing things rather worse than other banks, and that bank should face rising rates over time, uh, if possible. Now, in general, uh, my view is that actually the central banks, particularly including the ECB, have done pretty sensibly, have done really rather well in the rates at which they have lent uh, to their uh, various banks during the crises. And thank God they've ignored the academics who have said it should be at penalty rate. Um, um, now, um, let me move on to um, Hune. Um, Hune's paper was, as always, splendid. Um, but it didn't really deal with the question of how you should uh, assist the banks uh, in the global international frequently dollar borrowing when they get into difficulty. Um, and my view of the great financial crisis is that the single most important step uh, was undertaken by the Fed uh, when they uh, liberalized uh, and provided dollar swaps, obviously at their initiative, uh, on a much broader basis. Uh, over the weekend, October the 10th, October the 13th, they changed their policy. Uh, prior to October the 10th, they had provided very limited dollar swaps, a small amount to the ECB, uh, at rates that were really rather high. After October the 10th, 13th, uh, they provided massive uh, swap lines, not only to the big four, uh, ECB, BOE, BOJ, and SNB, uh, but to a much wider range, including a number of emerging countries. And that, I think, was the single most important step taken to defuse uh, the great financial crisis, because the great financial crisis was quite largely uh, centered in the US and related to the availability of dollar funding. And of course, non-Fed national central banks cannot provide dollar funding. Uh, now, my real worry about the next potential crisis is what would happen if under pressure, shall we say political pressure from you know whom, uh, the Fed was discouraged from issuing dollar swaps. Uh, I think that we'd be in the soup, and I don't know uh, I, either what the probability uh, of the Fed being discouraged from issuing dollar swaps, nor exactly how and to what extent we should prepare ourselves instead uh, for that possible eventuality. Um, I think I will try and turn now, because a discussant is supposed to discuss uh, the other papers as they came along. This was particularly difficult in the case of Jean, because uh, Jean... Um, the, the John's slides were somewhat different from the, the lengthy papers that he provided before. And, I'm, I, and I find his papers splendid, but I got con very confused at one point, and I'll try and tell you why. It's about deposit insurance. Uh, now, Jean said clearly, and I think we all agree, that European deposit insurance is a good thing, but whose deposits are going to get insured? Now, if you're just talking about retail deposits, that's obviously a good thing, particularly ex post if any bank actually goes down, so the retail depositors are protected. Um, but it doesn't actually protect you very much from runs because retail depositors are very sticky. And you know the statistic for the UK, you're more likely to change your partner than you are to change your bank. Um, so that, I, you know, retail depositors are very slow. They, on the whole, don't run unless the media sort of make a meal of it, as they did with Northern Rock. Uh, so the real runners are, of course, the uh, wholesale depositors. And what I, I don't know, uh, either whether Jean wants wholesale depositors everywhere to be insured, 
strikes me as a somewhat moral hazard. And if it's, you don't have wholesale depositors insured, actually, European deposit insurance isn't going to do very much for you because it's the wholesale depositors who are the danger. And also, he raised the, the question of uh, how about retail deposits in non-bank financial intermediaries like money market mutual funds? And again, I don't know whether that is suggested to be included in the European deposit insurance or not, and whether, if it's not, whether it should be. And so the interesting bits about deposit insurance are the bits that actually nobody talks about, which is who should it include and who should it not include. And if it, if it fails to include the people who run, does it actually do you that much benefit ex ante? Now let me turn on to uh, uh, and end with um, uh, Martin's paper. Um, first, um, he talked about the usage of the money market of the interbank markets, and I would just mention that if the central banks around the world, <coughs> like the Fed and ECB, uh, maintain a floor rather than a corridor system of monetary operations, that will lead to the permanent uh, ending uh, of the interbank market as a meaningful uh, market at all. Because the flow system simply satiates uh, commercial banks uh, with so much money they don't need to lend to each other. Um, I'd like to uh, emphasize again the point that Martin made about the need for liquidity in resolution. Uh, and I'd like to make two points. First, uh, even when you had bailout, and so when the bank got taken over by the state and was therefore clearly and totally, utterly safe, you still needed a great deal of liquidity. And w there was a paper that looked at the deposit flows out of con continental Illinois and the, a large majority of the outflows occurred after it had been bailed out. Now, why do you do that? Well, the answer to, there, to that is that a large number of corporate treasurers don't like to have to confess uh, to their boards that they had deposits in a bank that turned out to be rather bad. Now, that flow out of a bank in resolution will be far greater under the bail-in proposal. <laughs> it will certainly continue to be much greater uh, if we have the ESM, where you have to have 8% bail-in before the ESM actually kicks in. And the reason for that is the bank will not only have a, now, a bad reputation, but after bail-in, it will actually be a lot weaker than all its counterpart, its equivalent banks, because it has lost the bail in debt buffer well, the other banks all still have their bail in debt duffer. Under these circumstances, the liquidity outflow uh, from a bank subject to bail-in is going to be very, very large. And the central banks have got to be in a position incapable of actually meeting that. And so all that Martin said on that, I would, I would em uh, emphasize. Uh, I think the final point in all of this is that I, again, dealing to Martin, Martin talked about the need for a slow and orderly winding up. Um, and that, I think, is, is, uh, was an option that should have been given much greater consideration. Uh, there's a very uh, good recent book by Larry Ball uh, on the uh, Lehman crisis and what, the way the Fed handled it. And Larry's argument is that the Fed could legally, un, although Ben Bernanke uh, denied it, could legally have provided financing uh, to Lehman's. But the reason it didn't was not a legal argument, uh, but that the general counsel for the Fed in New York kept on using the phrase, uh, lending to Lehman's would like be building a bridge to nowhere. They couldn't see any mechanism whereby Lehman's could actually regain profitability reasonably quickly and continue. So they felt that they had no alternative but to bring it to a close immediately. But 
bringing it to a close immediately in what inevitably was rather disorderly conditions, would have been far worse than taking it over, lending to it, and undertaking a slow wind-up, uh, which takes a long time uh, to do. And anyhow, uh, Peter has just indicated to me that I must wind up, and I always obey the chairman of the day. St uh, thanks, Charles. <laughs> It's very difficult to stop you, actually. It's so interesting. And, uh, <laughs> no, uh, what you said on, on the, the uh, cost you know, of uh, funding, liquidity funding. I remember when I came in 2011, you know, there was this dollar funding facility. And because of the stigma, no bank was coming, although they had collectively problems. And then we changed just the pricing, and then the problem was rapidly uh, addressed. You know, and, uh, so I have a Q&A now session, and maybe you intervene also on, on, uh, you know, on the other interview. I have Benoit <coughs> here, his first intervention. Yeah, thank you, and Peter. In the back. <clears throat> so that was a fascinating panel, and uh, I very much hope that the discussion can also uh, expand a little bit on, uh, on uh, issues related to market liquidity, because that's newer in the discussion, in a sense. I mean, we've been discussing land of last resort for years and years. I'm not saying that there are easy solutions, but the, I think the, the framework is known, while for market liquidity there are lots of uh, unknowns. So I would, I would learn a lot if you could ex expand a little bit on, uh, on, on these issues. But I, I just wanted to maybe to complement what Martin said on, uh, on lending in, um, in resolution. Um, and I basically mostly agree with your conclusion, Martin, so it's not, uh, uh, I'm not taking issues here, but it might be, it might be useful to um, maybe to, um, to explain a little bit what's the current, what are the options here uh, when it comes to lending in resolution. Um, and I speak under the control of uh, the uh, single resolution mechanism chair, Elke, because, who has a vital stake uh, in that discussion. Um, so what we do currently is when a bank is, failing, is deemed failing or likely to fail, we cap central bank liquidity um, at its uh, prevailing level um, because until uh, solvency is restored. So presumably at the end of the resolution process. And when we say solvency, it's not capital being positive. It's capital being above regulatory ratios. So say 7% CET1. So it's, the, the bar is pretty high in terms of what we call solvency here. Um, and uh, obviously, we can al always take extraordinary measures if, uh, if we know that uh, ELCO will uh, not deem a resolution in public in as, as a matter of public interest. If, if we know that the bank is going to be uh, put in insolvency, obviously, then we may want to take more drastic decisions. So it's, it depends, uh, obviously, on the situation. But let's assume that there is a resolution process being uh, worked out by the uh, SRB. Doesn't mean that there are no options for liquidity. Uh, there, is, there may be market liquidity. Probably not initially, but there may be some options to, to access markets. Uh, there may be m money provided by the, by the SRF itself, and it is uh, under the uh, uh, um, mandate of the Single Resolution Fund to provide liquidity to banks. And as you said, Martin, the SRF is small, but it may be enough in many cases for smaller or medium-sized banks. But it's also why it's important that the current discussion on uh, providing a backstop to the SRF includes a liquidity function. So that the ESM would also be in a position to lend to the to top up the uh, single resolution fund also for a liquidity purpose uh, to uh, to mitigate that that constraint. Um, and then there is emergency liquidity assistance, uh, but and it's always possible and it's a baseline in a sense. But emergency liquidity assistance is not it is suboptimal and it may even not be possible. It is suboptimal because it's local, it's national, so it uh, it uh, it perpetuates the doom loop. Uh, so it's not good in terms of how we want the system to work. And you may even challenge in the first place why uh, national central banks would take a risk that the ECB doesn't want to take. And the answer was, yes, the answer was they, there might be an argument when supervision was local because then uh, national central banks had superior information about the bank, but uh, not any longer now that supervision is, uh, is European, at least, at least for the largest banks. And it may not even be possible because uh, the, uh, the bank may simply not have enough collateral. And that happens. That happens. Uh, and in some extreme cases, we, ECB, may even deem that the liquidity ELA provision is, uh, interferes, interferes with monetary policy, and then we may want to stop it uh, under Article 14.4 of the statute. So that's obviously in extreme cases, but it's possible that uh, we, uh, we may deem that it's not, uh, it contradicts uh, monetary policy. 
And I, I'm insisting very much on this issue of collateral shortages because it's a fact of life and we may be faced with cases when uh, even a good resolution plan designed by the SRB uh, may, be, may, may not work because of a collateral shortage and that the bank would have to be put in insolvency just because of lack of collateral. So it's a very, it's a very possible solu possibility. And so the obvious solution, as you say, Martin, is that there would be some kind of European guarantee provided that would allow the bank to remain in monetary policy. And the, that guarantee would have to come from either the SRF or the ESM or any kind of other European scheme that would uh, allow a continued provision of outside liquidity uh, in case of stress, that would uh, avoid fiscal dominance over the ECB because the residual risk of uh, the, the resolution failing would be taken by the fiscal authority, not by the monetary authority. Um, and um, that would align responsibility and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and liability, uh, because supervision being European, liability would also be European. So that's a discussion we're having with European finance ministers. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult discussion. Uh, I'm not expecting it to, uh, to yield a very quick results, uh, but it's certainly a discussion that, uh, that should go on. It raises many difficult issues. That can be, as Jean said, that can be a strategic game between the national level and the European level because some liquidity would be ELA, which is national risk, some liquidity would be monetary policy liquidity, which is European risk. You can imagine all kinds of strategic games here, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's going to be a difficult discussion, but it's very important that that discussion can yield uh, positive results. Thank you very much for the very interesting discussion. My question is to Hyun Song Shin about the dollar liquidity. Everybody from emerging markets will indeed uh, say that dollar liquidity is probably the most important thing in terms of liquidity assessment. But then the next uh, logical question is, what is the response of central banks? In particular, I have in my mind, what's the evidence on the levels of international reserves? Uh, I think there is some evidence by Opsfeld and Alan Taylor that they're saying that the, now the international reserves in emerging markets are record heights, and the only way you can explain it is not capital flow, sudden stops, but really the size of the financial, financial system, which is leading to the next question. So that's question number one. And the question number two is, if indeed central banks have in their mind the uh, dollar liquidity, and hence they uh, have that much international reserves, do we observe moral hazard issues there? Uh, meaning that actually corporates uh, overborrow in foreign currency because they actually observe that central bank uh, uh, accumulate lots of reserves that risk in their mind. Thank you. Thank you. Of Charles, of Charles, I think that that deserves an answer now. Okay. Is that Tom? Yes. Uh, very briefly, um, the point of uh, the point with Matthias on uh, retail deposits versus wholesale deposits in a sense is just going back to the question: Why? How do we think about uh, the LCR? Right? I'm saying I'm not in favour, of course, of uh, insuring wholesale deposits, but rather uh, I'm just saying they are de facto insured. That's what I'm saying. So in a sense, uh, that means that retail deposits should actually be have a run factor of one and not the zero or, the, or five percent. Um, but more generally, it's, it's a broader theme, which is, you know, you have a whole series of claims on the bank which are not billionable and a very, very long series. And, you know, how do you deal with those? And that's, that's what you have to take into account um, when you build your LCR. Um, the migration to the shadow banking sector, so it's money market mutual funds, but in many other things as well. Uh, we live in a world where we have tightened the prudential regulation, which is good. The logical consequence of that, and you see it, for example, with subprime in the US, but many other examples, is that you have migration to other shadow banking sector. And the big danger now is the shadow banking sector is going to contaminate the rest of the thing. <laughs> The point I was making about market, money market mutual funds is that they shouldn't, uh, if they de facto have access to deposit insurance, they also have to pay a premium. That's a level playing field. But more generally, I think there's a whole issue about the migration of depositors, small investors, uh, small and medium enterprises, all the core functions of banks uh, to other shadow banking sector where they will have 
just as they had to some extent in 2008, access to public liquidity, uh, quasi-deposit insurance, uh, bailout liquid facilities, and so on. And that's a big danger, I think. And Jean, uh, on, sorry, sorry, Martin, but just on, on this, if you have a run, you know, on, uh, from an, an asset management company, because you, you alluded to that point in your presentation, what would be the reaction, I mean, uh, of, of central banks to well, that? I think, that, you know, if it's well structured, there should be no run because it's de facto insured. Right. <laughs> uh, otherwise, it's a more complicated thing. But I think it should be a clear contract. Because, yeah, because this I, is. I, a, I can yeah. get access to, to some kind of insurance, mm -hmm. a facility or quasi deposit, not billionability, and so mm -hmm. on. And then you should be paying for that, or, I mean, it should be completely clear. You should not have a, a free subsidy. Yeah, because, I mean, because the big question is that we, we don't know really uh, in the asset management company what is the risk of a run. We know in, in some of the big ones, you know, how it's managed. We don't know very much also the links between asset managers, how they hedge their liquidity risk, you know, not only with constraints on redemption, but also, you know, pro probably liquidity lines, and we know that, so li liquidity lines for, from banks, of course, which themselves have facilities with with central banks. So, I mean, you still have this, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, network uh, on, on liquidity provision. And, and the information is, is still difficult to get. I mean, I'm, I'm not in that business of uh, supervision, but it's very difficult to know, actually. So you say if the contract is well designed, it's okay, but we don't know exactly how it is. And then you mentioned the pitfalls, you know, of, uh, of central bank intervention in the asset management, if you have a market a risk at some point. We discussed that also, you know, a few months ago. In, uh, in Vienna or somewhere, you know, it was. And, uh, so, I mean, this remains one of the big questions, given also the uh, rich pricing of some assets uh, worldwide. You know. so, uh, so that's still, yeah, yes, Martin. Where, when I referred to ECB as providing funding, I meant providing funding with guarantees from some fiscal agency without control. I would actually pref I don't think the ECB should get involved in the actual business of resolution. I also think that having supervision under the same roof as the central bank is a problem. I know how, uh, how and why it came, came about. <coughs> But the moment you have one institution with a dual responsibility, uh, there is a problem about accountability and there are uh, problems about incentive distortions. You don't want to rock the boat for monetary policy purposes, so maybe you maintain banks for too long. You don't want banks to go under, so maybe you cater monetary policy to the needs of banks. Those are trade-offs <coughs> that I would rather avoid, but I appreciate why we came to the system we have. Let me also take uh, uh, Benoit's question also on, on understanding market liquidity. We've talked a lot about banks, and uh, through, through history and through experience, we have accumulated uh, um, some expertise on uh, on dealing with, um, with uh, banking stress. I think we know less about uh, stress associated with market liquidity. Uh, the, the actors have changed, and uh, rather than having leveraged players, we have uh, asset managers who are mostly not leveraged, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we have seen risk premiums fluctuating. Um, so I think understanding what makes asset managers tick, I think, would be, uh, would be a very important uh, line on the agenda. Uh, going back to original sin, uh, although original sin in the in the original Eichen Green uh, Hausman sense has been overcome, it could be that we have simply shifted the original sin one step further back, and that uh, if the risk management uh, routines and uh, rules are operating at the asset manager level that uh, take account of the currency mismatch, then uh, we will see that um, uh, being being played out one level removed. Um, so I think, uh, in general, uh, we, we talk about borrower a lot. So when, whenever there's a political crisis uh, and the market sells off, we, we tend to focus on what's happening in the borrower's country. 
but uh, we uh, focus, I think, far too less on how uh, the asset uh, managers and the portfolio choices are being influenced, and how the risk premium shocks are propagating through the system. And I think there we have to think more globally uh, because uh, it's a cliche, but everything is connected to everything. Uh, now uh, we have very diversified portfolios. And I think this is where the banking sector comes in, in that uh, the currency hedging is provided by the banks. Uh, and so the, the banking sector is still involved, but in a, in a way that's different from uh, the ways that, uh, that they were before. On the question of what to do, um, I think uh, there are some short-term prescriptions which have to do with uh, using whatever buffers you have to smooth uh, the currency fluctuations. And I think the lesson that I would just uh, underline is that exchange rates do play a very important financial role. It's, it is a financial uh, conditions propagator as well as the uh, real economy adjustment mechanism. And uh, to the extent that you want to smooth things on the way down, you would want to also lean against the wind on the way up. So building buffers would be a very important aspect of that. And I think uh, you, you mentioned the, the build-up reserves. In the longer term, you would want to develop your domestic uh, asset manager base, so uh, your domestic pension funds, your domestic um, life insurance companies who measure returns, who liability, whose liabilities are denominated in local currency, or whose obligations are denominated in local currency, so that uh, the returns themselves could be uh, measured in local currency. I think that would be uh, one way to ensure that there is a pool of investors for whom uh, who would be the natural buyers of some of these assets. And I think that would be an important aspect of um, developing capital markets. So it's not just issuing in local currency. You have to develop the buyers who are the natural buyers of uh, those assets as well. Thank you. I think it's time now for the, the coffee break. Huh? We are almost on time. So uh, thank you very much for the participants.